All right, so survey of the Gospels. Um, for those of you that know a little bit about apologetics and other issues, um, systematic theology, reliability of the New Testament, all of these things come to play, you know, that we've covered in the last couple of years. So um, we will touch on quite a bit uh, tonight. So I told you from the beginning that we would not just do survey of the Gospels. We will explore, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, which are known as the Synoptic Gospels, and then John, who's sort of doing his own thing, right, with the deity of Christ. It's not a chronology uh, like you would see in Matthew or Luke. But uh, nonetheless, <clears throat> I refuse to just do focus on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John without touching on, on sort of like the Christian worldview tied together into the matter because it, 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 you got to connect the dots. So New Testament, we have 27 books, some of which are letters, right? Epistles, uh, Gospels, historical account like the Synoptics, and uh, of course the Book of Revelation. What would we call that? The Apocalypse of John. Jesus Christ directly communicating right to John, um, who is now the, the, the last living disciple. Um, there are only seven authors, and each person is writing from either an eyewitness testimony, eyewitness testimony, or a perspective of having known or, or, or learned directly from one or more of the apostles. That's very, very key. So let me ask you, who would Barth Bartholomew, just a name coming to mind. Where would he fit the place? Where would he? Where does he fit in? Did Bartholomew was he one of the twelve? Okay. What about Titus? So that would be one example versus say John or Bartholomew. Okay. So <clears throat> um, there's one example. Um, Another one would be Luke, who traveled with Paul. He was a traveling companion with Paul, Dr. Luke, very sophisticated uh, in the Koine Greek. He writes like a scholar comparison to the tax collector, Matthew, right, or Mark, and the same thing uh, with John. Um, he's very sophisticated. And, of course, Luke, right, we have a sequel, which is what? The Book of Acts, written to uh, what part of the world? Whom did Luke write to? He wrote to believers and unbelievers and Roman officials to the most excellent Theophilus, right, in Rome, scholars maintain. Um, so, given the composition of the New Testament books or New Testament documents, like F.F. F. Bruce would say, by the way, that's a book you, you should get, small little book, the New Testament Documents by F.F. F. Bruce, a uh, great guy. Viewed today as a scholar, back in his day, you really didn't need a Ph.D., so he has a master's degree, but most scholars even quote, quote him, at least in our circles, even to this day. Is Don't know. Um, when I read New Testament scholars, I could care less where they're at eschatologically, you know? Um, the same thing if I'm, if I'm reading a theologian, well, I, w I want to know where he's at, but really, uh, what his view, I I'm not into learning just his eschatology. You know, I have Wayne Grudem's book on systematic theology, all right? Well, I prefer systematic theology written by a philosopher, <laughs> Norman Geisler, because I like the way it's written, you know, arguments for and against. And just the way he goes through church fathers, and here's this view, and arguments for and against, uh, not to confuse people, you know. So if you sort of like have your own perspective uh, or your own bias and you read a guy like Geisler, well, it's, it's systematic theology, as four volumes said, it's not necessarily persuading you, look, you've been believing the wrong thing. It's more like, well, maybe I need to cross-check that one and then cross-check that with Geisler, you know. But uh, just uh, more thorough. And I have, I have friends of mine that uh, have PhD now. And they're like, oh, I didn't know Geisler was a theologian. What are you using for a textbook? That kind of, you know, 
snobbery. Well, why don't you write one then and see if it's as good? You know, he's taught theology longer than you've been breathing. You know, so humble yourself a little bit. In any event, several people, several different people at different places this week saying, "Oh, well, if you have to do it, just do it." Yeah. Yeah, and it's a bummer. It's a bummer. <laughs> when people see, yeah, it's, it's this fideism, right? Fiducia, fideism. Take it all by faith, fideism. Yeah, I have a friend. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm taking Herman Moody's right now. He's like, what's that? And I was like, oh, you know, it's, you know, Bible interpretation. He's like, oh, is that with or without the Holy Spirit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a yeah. jostling joke, but that's where he comes from. Yeah. Seminary, cemetery, same well, thing. Gracie said that a couple weeks ago. The yeah, but you know, la 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 last week, Grace was saying, hey, appreciate you clarifying some things, because some of these things, you know, is sort of, unless you sit down and study it, either you read on your own, or you go to school, or, or participate in a class like this, you know, it's, it's quite a bit of it's hit and miss. You get it from the pulpit, you get it from radio, and then you're talking to friends. And uh, if those friends are into... X, Y, and Z, well, you know, do you just flow with a boat? I prefer not to, you know. Um, but we'll get to some of those issues. You're going to go, that happened to me, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's just and it's not to defend of, it. Know, really, just crazy amount of, um, whatever you call that, whatever you call that, attacks. You yeah, know, yeah. From Christians. Yeah. We'll be not from non-believers. Right. What are you taking? Oh, biblical studies. Oh, okay. It's coming from the Christians. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Recognize also that this, uh, when people are, look, you don't have to, what we're doing here today, this is not like hardcore intellectualism, you know, like philosophical theology. This is basic stuff. That would just be helpful if most Christians knew about it. But, but most Christians are lazy. And they, they ride on the wings of the Holy Spirit thinking they're doing the right thing, you know. And so when you look at the Bereans, they were more fair-minded, right? We have, we're going to talk about that passage a little bit. Second Timothy, uh, right, inspiration. Do they really know what that means? Um, and then you have in Hebrews, right, diligently, diligently studying the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of truth, right? And some of us have sharper swords than others. Mm -hmm. Amen. So you kind of have to just recognize that, and you can't be prideful in that. Um, you can lash back with an argument that'll slap them blue, and then they feel bad because you hurt the little feelings. But see, they're doing the same thing to you. I normally just walk. You know, put it, put it mildly. I don't know. I don't know too many believers like that because I don't hang around believers like that. Yeah. Except for if I'm in a classroom. Remember what book it was in? One or yeah. maybe it was this one. Contend without being contentious. Like that. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. Okay. Season your word, words with salt. Yeah. Right? Be harmless like a dove. Right? But sometimes we need to strike too. With the truth. But we are being attacked outside the church and inside the church. And, and what we have to remember is for the last 2,000 years, you wouldn't even have, we wouldn't have a Bible unless it were for what? Canonicity. We wouldn't have the reliability of the New Testament unless it was for textual criticism, mm -hmm. historical criticism. All of these big words that just mean something, the, the approaches, you know, authorship, who wrote it, you know, comparing texts and, and mm -hmm. all of this stuff, you wouldn't even have a canon. Yeah, I saw Tobit today at the museum. I, I saw, I saw your text. Yeah, no, yeah. I saw, yeah, I saw your text. Yeah, they had Tobit there. That was, I thought that was interesting. That's great. Oh, you go to the Dead Sea Yeah, yeah, it's really, really good. I saw it in San Diego yeah. years ago, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to take my son to this one because he wants to see him in Israel. Yeah. Is that the same collection? That was I don't in San Diego? know. I, mean, for me, I don't know. It's a science museum. It's in the middle of you know homosexual Mecca, Los Angeles. Wow. And here we are. Here hmm. we are, full on quoting the Ten Commandments over the loudspeaker. Furthermore, you go to the gift shop and hmm. it's. The uh, Dead Sea Scrolls translated in English. Here's a New Testament. Here's a Bible for your baby. Here's, I mean, it was just nuts. Not That's that. awesome. This was so cool. That is awesome. I, mean, I wouldn't imagine it was the same one. You know, it's a reason is that had to be at a certain temperature at all times. That's why water always hit that uh, right. that rope at the shrine of the books. Right. I mean, so to be able to move that and 
and it's a big it's a big task. It's a huge task. Yeah. So All right. Sorry. Well, let's move on here because the viewers uh, will be. Uh, what are you guys talking about? These were not questions pertaining to the class. We're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and other things. All right. So, um, spiritual pride and uh, fideism, fideistic pride. We need to be careful with that, right? Talking about what you were you brought up, fiducia. There's a spiritual pride sometimes that'll come up in 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 not studying these things. And then when you go study these things, people will hit you upside the head and go, well, where did the Holy Spirit fit into all these things? You're reading books written by man. I'm just going to stick to the Bible. That type of thing. Well, uh, in the end, the one who studies these things, uh, whether you believe them or not, at least you, you're understanding and categorizing things, you'll have less heresy. Believe me, you. You'll be less heretical in your uh, prayers and uh, your studies, and if you're teaching, same thing. Except when you study that more, you're like, you don't know. <laughs> exactly. It's just crazy. So we have uh, Luke was such an example. He traveled with Paul, interviewed eyewitnesses uh, who were either directly taught by Jesus or in contact with him. So he went out there really trying to collect the data. For Theophilus, I believe it was a person, and now you can split here and go, no, it's written to the, to the believers in God, because... Theos, right? Phileo also means lovers of God. So some people will say, add that meaning. Maybe, I don't know if Luke had that approach, that he's writing to the churches of God, to the peoples of God, Theophilus, or if he wrote to a man. I believe Theophilus was a man, and I believe it was also written for us, but not to us. It was written to Theophilus, but for us, just like we made the distinction. The Bible was not written to you and I. It was written to the Hebrews, but for us. All right? So, given the composition of the New Testament books and their early dating, uh, it is impossible for legend and myth to have been developed for the simple reason that many eyewitnesses, including critics, it's good to have a few critics around, right, as you're launching a new faith. Mormonism didn't take off like gang fire. Jehovah's Witness did not take off like gang fire. Feeding on who? The weak-minded Christians. The cults will snag them up when the church don't do their job. That's exactly what happened. Christianity is a worldwide religion, right? Been the biggest for 2,000 years. So that's pretty, pretty impressive. It took off. And in the same city where you, you, you should have all the arguments against it had Jesus not risen from the dead. That's where rabbis, theologians, you know, historians, and the rest of them got saved, including statesmen. It wasn't just dumb peasants, like some would say. Oh, some dumb farmer somewhere believing anything. It was not. You know, going from Gamaliel to Nicodemus, who I believe actually became converted, to Saul of Tarsus, now Paul. So in the same city, which is smaller than the city of Jerusalem today, Within the old walls of Jerusalem, people would know what time it was. So there were critics, right? But they could not quench the birth of the new faith or the way later on uh, Christianity. So early dating is impossible for legend and myth to have been developed for the simple reason that eyewitnesses, critics, would still be alive to refute them. Typically, it takes two to three. Remember this. Typically, it takes two to three generations for a myth to develop and stick doesn't happen in the first generation. You might say, say today, hey, Abraham Lincoln was an alien. He was not a president. You've been just indoctrinated by the wrong <laughs> books. Okay. But try to say that during the era of Abe Lincoln or 50 years later. Yeah. All right? So, Holocaust so never happened. Yeah, yeah, Holocaust deniers, same thing. So um, two to three generations for a myth to develop and actually survive, flourish, stick. Right? Uh, for example, I'll give you one argument. You've heard the classical pagan argument. Look, uh, this whole thing about the deity of Jesus, that was added later by the church, right? Fourth, fifth century, maybe third. Nobody in first century Palestine, they'll say, or first century Israel, uh, believe these things about Jesus. All right? You can go to one book that liberal scholars believe. Paul wrote. Remember, I keep bringing this one up. First Corinthians. 
They all say Paul wrote this thing, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you can go to 1 Corinthians 15. There you are, the resurrection passage. You have the whole gospel in a summarized form. That he died. That he was buried. That it was raised on the third day. And just if you just look at the Pauline epistles, tell me you cannot figure out that Christ is divine. So Habermas will take that, take that approach when he's looking at the resurrection. He'll look at what the critics approve and says, what case can I build based on that? So like what you were saying on Populate, you're saying something uh, about uh, the disciples, uh, uh, and I says that's a good, great point, and, and, and oh, yeah. the, the whole thing is, Corey was making the point that when you read throughout the Gospels, and for example, Peter denying the Lord three times, you know, uh, Jesus' family, James, prior to conversion, uh, questioning Jesus, being the Son of God or His Messiahship or whatever you want to call it. If you want to doctor up a, a new faith, you would make everybody surrounding the life of Jesus look great. Because if I was, if I was Peter and Paul's over there, I wouldn't... Could, let's not have anybody state that you, you know you rebuked me and please drop the fact that I denied my Lord three times <laughs> these types of things when you see the weaknesses of the disciples in the Gospels and you see just how human and frail they are that screams authenticity because it's self-incriminating that chances are then that they're actually reported reporting things as they happen. They're reporting it truly. They're not making themselves out to hear, be heroes anywhere. You know, so to speak the truth is really to self-incriminate yourself, hence it is true. You guys understand that? That would be like a one-liner. Did I say that backwards or did I say that correctly? You guys with me? All right. So. I just have a quick question. Just out of curiosity, how old do you think the disciples were? Cycles. Disciples, the apostles. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure. So. Sometimes they were saying uh, back then that, you know, manhood was considered around the age of 14. Mm -hmm. 14 or no, no, John Mark was fairly young. You know, we know that John uh, li lived to be an old age. How, how really, what, what their age, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly. And uh, I don't know how we can deduce that. In any event, so as for the nature of these New Testament books or epistles or letters, New Testament documents as a whole, they are unique, authentic, and historically reliable. The New Testament Gospels have their own genre, their own genre, and we can call that gospel genre. Why am I making a case, um, or why am I going to cause a stink about gospel genre? Because there's a debate going on right now uh, between a New Testament scholar and Norman Geisler. And those who defend Geisler are not very popular. And those who defend the other, uh, the other brother uh, are more so popular. And I'm not going to get into that. I mean, one click on Google, you can find, find, find out. I'll tell you one thing, though. The guy who is uh, up against Geisler now, because Geisler is seeking to set him straight on inerrancy, that gentleman is definitely one of the best writers on the resurrection of Jesus. All right, and he studied on Gary Habermas at Liberty. Then it went to get uh, uh, you know further studies and New Testament studies. He's a New Testament scholar. Very difficult field to remain an evangelical if you want to be a New Testament scholar. And it's almost like if you're going to have a seat at the table, you better give some things up. You can't just sound like we do. And, and sit next to the New Testament scholars because most of them are liberal. That's sad. You know, I could never see myself being a liberal, wanting to be a New Testament scholar. It would feel like a waste of time to me. But, you know, people are different. Nonetheless, um, this word gospel genre, you can pull it from the debate of what's happening on inerrancy now between the gentleman and Geisler. And, um, for example, uh, we're going to get into some of this later in hermeneutics. There's allegories, right? There's symbolism. There's different genres, genres, all this stuff. When you read that um, the tombs were open in Jerusalem, right? And people were raised from the dead and corpses walked into Jerusalem. Yeah. Right? How many Gospels mention that? Matthew. One, right? 
you would think that would be such an apocalyptic event that people all over the world would have talked about it, especially in Jerusalem. At least one more document, somebody. I mean, Josephus, somebody. You know, Roman historians, nobody. So, uh, New Testament scholars, including our man, right, who's, who is on our side, but he's, he's playing the New Testament language, and I actually believe that he believes that he's correct. He says that uh, when you, you're writing like that, you know, I'm not gonna, not gonna quote him. What you're doing is sort of spiffing up the text a little bit to add apocalyptic uh, features to this big event of the resurrection of Jesus. Are you with me? So the tombs were open, even though they weren't. All right. Or for example, Garden of Gethsemane. Right. The disciples are supposed to be praying. They fall asleep. Right. Jesus is praying. Comes back. Can't you guys even keep an keep an eye? All right. Keep an eye out for me. And then they come in, right? You got the kiss of death from Judas and the, and the Ro uh, Romans and the, uh, uh, what's that? Yeah. They want to arrest him now in the garden and they say, what? What's their question to Jesus? Are you him? And he says, I am he. And they all fell backwards. It probably didn't happen. These are the things that you, you'll, you'll see even in some of our scholars now. And so Geisler's approach is, look, then you can't be an inerrantist. It's either this or it's not. And the large majority of our scholars are not taking Geisler's side. Mm, that's so sad. They're taking the other guy's side. Go, yeah, you can still believe in inerrancy. Mm. This is just, and here's, the, here's how they would get around the gospel genre. And I got that word straight from Geisler, those two words. They say, you know, this is just, you see this type of writing in first century. Right. You see it in Roman writings, Jewish writings. It was just, it was a known fact. So why would that be different, you know, for the Gospels? You know, this is the same type of genre. Geisler goes, no, this is Gospel genre. It's divine. It's inerrant, period. I don't care why they wrote like other people doesn't matter. And you can say hermeneutically, well, that's just how we communicated at that time, just like we communicate with parables. Mm -hmm. You with me? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm making a little bit of a stink of gospel genre, so you hear the whole context. So to refer to them as Greco-Roman genre is therefore wrong. And that's what scholars would agree on. It's a Greco-Roman genre. No, says Norm, it is gospel genre. And I'd rather, you know, err on the side of what I think it's right, right? Because I'm safer in that, in that spot. Um, outside non-Christian sources also confirm much of the New Testament, including various writings from noted Roman historians. Can you guys name one? Josephus. He was Jew. Josephus was Jewish. Tacitus. Tacitus, right? Pliny the Younger, right? Pliny the Older, Pliny the Younger, what more? Um, Sidonius, that's another one. Thank you very much. I will take my gold star now. There you go. You get two. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, from the perspective of law, from the perspective of law, given a courtroom setting, many legal experts have vouched in favor for the reliability of the New Testament. Can you think of one? Mr. Sir Simon Greenleaf, <laughs> Professor of law at Harvard, yeah. back when Harvard was somewhat okay, but it was still going south. Yeah. The law students were Christian, and the students going in, you know, for the most part, were very, you know, groomed within Christendom. Mm -hmm. They got Greenleaf up there, who's not a believer, who's making fun of the resurrection and everything else. And one of the students challenged him and says, hey, you know, you're an expert on legal evidence and all of these things. Why don't you apply? Use your criteria and apply to the resurrection, gospels, whatever you want, and we'll listen to see. Well, the guy just fell on his face and says, <laughs> it did happen. Simon Greenleaf, book, Testimony of the Evangelist. Great book. Okay, so where are we? Uh, in addition, much of archaeology has confirmed much of the New Testament. Interestingly, as, as critics seek to... Uh, explain, we seek to explain away the reliability of the New Testament in general. Last paragraph, various liberal scholars, here it is, agree that Paul, 
for sure penned down 1 Corinthians. And based on that letter alone, we can establish the fact that Jesus died, buried, rose again, uh, rose again on the third day. Um, each of these we'll touch on as we move on into the course. All right. Um, introducing Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, his birth was prophesied. His birth was later announced by the angel Gabriel to Mary in Nazareth. And who has been there? Yay! All right. Um, Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem, or Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean? Bethlehem? House of bread. House of bread. You're so smart. Oh, dear. But look, house of bread gave birth to the living bread. And yeah. We have manna in the desert. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should eat more bread. That would be a stretch, right? Sounds, yeah. Yes, like yes. from Sizzler. <laughs> What's that? Gluten free. Well. Gluten free. Uh, Jesus lived a most virtuous life, and by the way, Jesus lived a most virtuous life. Thinking about the swoon theory of the resurrection, right? Jesus swooned, you know, temporary coma. You know, somehow he undid that 2,000-pound stone, did taekwondo or tai kickboxing. The guards beat them up, walks around in town lying, I rose from the dead. Just doesn't fit the image. So throw that theory right out the door. Doesn't fit the facts either. But just looking at Jesus Christ as the most virtuous person who's ever walked this place, why attribute swoon or twin theory? You know, like Dr. Kevin at UC Irvine back in the day was trying to debate, just having a party. It's possible that he had a twin. You think Mary would have known? You think the disciples would have known? Did you think about these things? Anything to make a name for yourself. That maybe your twin theory and I will go down with swoon, and you'll be in the theologians' books, like the empty tomb, or I mean the wrong tomb theory. The women were drunk in the morning. Okay, well, they would have sobered up and found the right tomb. A little later, right? So... And anyways, those rival hypotheses don't work. He performed a rigorous ministry of miracles, exorcisms, giving life to the dead, including his own literal and physical resurrection. He introduced a new teaching contrary to much of Judaism, in particular oral traditions. Uh, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. His disciples sincerely believed Jesus was raised from the dead. His followers denied polytheism, the worship of many gods common in the Roman Empire. Hence, they were accused of what? Being atheists. Atheists. And I know uh, many in here don't believe in the Eucharist, right? But when they had communion, here's an argument for the Eucharistos, is that they were accused of not just being atheists because they were monotheists. You believe in just one God, you're an atheist under Roman law. So now they were also accused of being cannibals. They're meeting again next door, drinking and eating the body of the Messiah, wherever that is. So, uh, interesting when you look at that in early Christianity and the Eucharist versus do this only in remembrance of me in a symbolic way. All right? So you have various views uh, that d this stuff makes me think about. No, it's not in my notes. About one of the things you yes, ma'am. He introduced a new teaching contrary to much of Judaism. Yeah. He introduced oral tradition. No, no, versus, versus, yeah, Talmudic okay. writings and that type of That's stuff. Okay. Yeah. And of course it was hard. If you were, uh, I mean, look, I believe he was, he was talking to the Pharisees more than he talked to anybody else. I believe it was more of the Pharisaic school mindset because they knew what time it was. <laughs> uh, and they didn't just believe in the, in the Old Testament. They, I mean, they believed in oral tradition on steroids. There was, Moses didn't just come down with ten tablets. There was more stuff that was being said. And so imagine now, you're set in that tradition for a very long, long, long time. Jesus comes on the saying, hey, listen, you need to lighten up a little bit. Uh, I am the Logos, and here is what that passage means, etc. You just see how hard it would be to, you know, to, your whole worldview. Just like, really? You're telling me yeah, this? Actually, on the wall today, they, they, they said, oh, the Ten Commandments were important, but then there were 615, I can't think of the word, Nicobus or something like that. I can't think of it. But it was Pharisee. Anybody called. Mishnah? Something like that. Okay. It's basically laws, traditions that were equally important as the Ten Commandments. Exactly. I was like, yeah. uh-uh. 
And remember too that on the Sabbath you only you can only carry so much, yeah. right? Walking around, you can't drive. So if you're driving on the Shabbat in Jerusalem, everybody knows you're. I mean, the Jews would say that's a pagan, <laughs> and you're a well-meaning Christian or a Messianic Jew. You're the only one driving around, you know. And of course, we do that all the time because that's a good day to get around, <laughs> right? But um, you know. One way, when, 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 when God rested on the Sabbath, right, it's not because he was tired, right? right. He, was, he was just enjoying his creation. It served as, ooh, symbolic, right? Symbolism served as uh, laying out the seven days that we need to rest on the seventh day. Last Sunday, I had to work. It wasn't fun, but I had to. Yeah. So, I miss church, and I don't like missing church. I miss church. Other people miss church. And it shouldn't be that way either, should it? But um, there we go. I have no idea what just happened. Um, but but what what the Pharisees would do? They would they would recognize that okay, let's just say you can only carry two loaves of bread, right, on the Sabbath. Yeah. You can't carry anything more. And let's say you can you can't go within uh, outside of your property more than five feet. Let's just make that up. I mean, they have this type yeah, of stuff. Yeah, Sabbath days walk, Sabbath days burden, all of that. All of that stuff. And so some got so creative and says, you know, if I tie a rope around my property fence line, it can be a 500-foot rope tied around my waist, and I keep walking. All of them, I'm extending my property line. Oh. They said, well, let's write that down. That's good. So-and-so said. Or if your wife overcooks your eggs, right? Mm -hmm. Hillel school, go ahead. You can divorce your wife. Really? Where is that in Moses' writings? Well, tradition is right there. Go ahead. That is pretty sensitive. Yeah, it is. Very. Yeah, so what, what was That's what Jesus is coming in going, wait a second, you guys. Excuse me, right? Go ahead. Yeah, so what was, the, what was the official process of getting some of those things added to what's considered law? I mean, what was it? Just that it goes through the Sanhedrin and they vote? Or what, I mean, how's it? Well, Sanhedrin hasn't been around forever. Okay, but, so then what, what, what was well, okay, I don't know if, if the right word is to say a process. I would say, have you looked at the Talmud, for example? You should stop by the library and just pick up a Talmud. Or remind me, send me a text uh, next Monday, and I'll bring one of them down. Um, uh, same thing, Mishnah. Imagine having a, a big book, and you have a, a cluster of verses right in the center of the page, and all these commentaries around, right, written around, I would add it over the years. Uh, Rabbi so and so says, right? Um, it's 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 the only way I can compare it to is, and this is, the Jews would probably have a problem with this, and so would Rome and the Orthodox Church. Um, when Jesus says the gates of hell will never prevail against the church, Craig, do you think he was correct? Right. All right. The church gave you the Bible, right? Not Martin Luther King, not Martin Luther either. Martin Luther King, that's a joke, All right? All right, so who gave you the church? I mean, the, the, the canon. Well, the Holy Spirit, the church did. All right, either you trust or you don't. So in the church now, right, you have all these added things to the scriptures, for example, including the Vatican II, that council, which a lot of Catholic priests have issues with. But just going back through the councils, they would say, this is all of the Lord. Would, would the Roman Catholic say it's absolutely equal? No, but if you can extrapolate from Moses an idea and theologically justify that, and then by the time the Sanhedrin is established, well, now you've got a theocracy, right? It's not just plain Ten Commandments anymore. So you have just a huge tradition of uh, Rabbi so-and-so, an appeal to authority. I'm not going to say that they, they believe, you know, divorcing your wife or overcooking your eggs had anything to do with Mount Sinai. I'm not going to go there that it's like equally inspired. But if you start off with, with Mosaic law and extrapolate further in the world of theocracy, you can make that law. Muslims today deny Sharia law has anything to do with Islam, right? The moderate Muslims. Maybe not all of them, but a lot of them don't speak up about it. But no, Sharia law has nothing to do with that. Yeah, it does. You can justify Sharia law based on, on, on the Quran and the Hadith. Plain and simple. But everything that's within Sharia law, right, doesn't make it Quranic. 
Oh, but it makes it Islamic. Do you know what I'm saying? Mishnah. Yeah, Mishnah. Mishnah, you're right, yeah. There's the Mishnah and then there's the there's Talmud. Too, so I wasn't sure which one. All right, but anyway, um, let's move on. Okay. You know, if you have my book, Jesus is in the Messiah of Israel, yes. I talk about some of those things in chapter one. Mm -hmm. uh, not more so, more, more proving the messianic nature of the scrolls, various scrolls. All right, let's move on. Um, uh, the disciples of Jesus, they worshipped him. He accepted worship on multiple occasions. If he didn't do that, um, no reason to uh, believe that it was divine. So when somebody worships you, that would be a perfect opportunity for Jesus to say, hey, don't do that. Only worship God. Instead, he says, me and the Father are one. Thomas flies on his face, right, in the upper room. What does he say? Hakurios mu kayafeas mu. The Lord of mine and the God of mine. Cultists will say, Thomas was cursing. Oh my God, it's you, Jesus. What's up? How do you get in? Right? Now, they're not saying you are literally God. Yeah, in context, a Jewish boy would not say the Lord of mine and the God of mine. A kurios, right? Kurios is Lord. Mu, kai ha, theos. Theos, God. The God of mine. Um... He asked his followers to pray in his name. His teachings spread rapidly, and a new movement known as the Way quickly spreading grew. His followers believed they were immortal in that they had a surety of the afterlife or immortality due to the resurrection fact of Jesus. They too would be rise, right? Hey, you're going to crucify me upside down? I'm not worthy. Slap me on a cross, right? Upside down, because I'm not worthy to be crucified as Jesus. That's what I meant to say. Uh, traditionally, that's the, that's the argument for Peter. Um, his followers had, had contempt for death. His followers, excluding Judas, had no contempt for material goods and earthly comfort. Many of these points are also confirmed by outside sources of the biblical text. Again, so you got the Jewish historian. Here we go. Josephus, Roman writer Tacitus, Antonius, and um, Thallus, and uh, uh, various uh, other names. All right, Pliny the Younger, P-L-I-N-Y is one to remember as well. Uh, New Testament, far from myth, concerning the, historian, cons concerning the historian Luke, who authored Luke and Acts, Luke shares minute geographical details that are known, as it was to be known to his readers. Uh, he also offers specialized details known only to special groups. He lists specific routes, places, and officials that were not widely known at the time. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's important? We would call this, what? Historical criticism versus textual criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there is a clear correlation of dates in Acts and confirmed history. Luke shares events that give, gives a sense of immediacy. Idioms and cultures uh, in culture that, that bespeak a first-hand awareness is also present in the writings of Luke. Remember, most excellent Theophilus, I will go to town and figure these things out, giving you an accurate account. I'm going to interview everybody. I'm going to go talk to Mary. You know, die-hard guy. Uh, in Acts, there was a clear verification of numerous details of times, people, and events of that period, best known by contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Very important stuff. Concerning the Gospels, Matthew dates somewhere between 40 and 60 A.D. If 40 is correct, this would only be seven years following the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, probably written in Syria to Jews in Syria. Um, and this information you can actually find out in Wayne House's book, Chart Books of the New Testament. Very good source. Uh, Mark, between 45 and 60 AD, probably written in Rome to Christian Romans. Um, Luke, 57, 62. They're all fairly close. Some say 60 to 62. Uh, probably written in Rome like we mentioned earlier, to Gentile Christians, that would be House 93, uh, and to Roman officials interested in Christianity, also in House 93. Uh, John, some say early 80s or 90s. The liberal date is 40 through 65. 
Now, I go with the older date of John, 96, writing in Ephesus. Um, am I just doing that for the, for the fun of it? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it? Why should we go with early dates for Corinthians, like 56 AD, uh, etc.? And all of a sudden, we get to John. No, nope, we don't want to go with an early date on that one. Give me one reason why you think that might be the case. Maybe that has to do with eschatology a little bit. What do you think? Because the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, right? Now, you could say if you're uh, uh, of, of the older date persuasion, you could say, don't you think John would have written that down, that the temple was just destroyed? But you could also say, don't you think that John would have even mentioned that in a later date? If he wrote in 95, 96, why wouldn't John write that? Give it, give it a guess. Why would John not include? By the way, a while back, the temple in Jerusalem, our temple was destroyed by the Romans. Why would he not say that? He wasn't allowed to. He was directed by the Holy Spirit to write John exactly the way it is. So he would have been disobedient if he would have penned that down. That would be a pretty, pretty fair answer. So that goes for both date setters. In any event, um, John probably written in Ephesus to believers and non-believers throughout the region. Um, How's 93 again? All right, the nine writers of the New Testament. Good to see you, Gracie. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector, chapter 10, verse 3. We know that. Uh, Mark was an associate of Peter, 1 Peter 5.13. Luke, the doctor, associate, traveling companion of Paul. We have that in 2 Timothy 4.11. John was an apostle and an eyewitness, John 21.24. You also check out 1 John 1. Um, Verse, the first four verses. And Peter was also an apostle and a contemporary. We have that in Acts 9, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, is also uh, one of the authors. Now, the Gospels are not doctrinal or hardcore, systematic, theological, philosophical work, works. They include that. All right? As said before, they are biographies of Jesus. That would be, does that include John? Is that written like a biography? No. Matthew, Mark, Luke. The synoptic gospels are biographies. But you could equally say, well, John starts off with, an, with, with a biography that starts above. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 and the Word became flesh right, and dwelt among us. The two nature, the diophyses, the hypostatic union into one. Um, however, as far as the theological emphasis and themes are concerned, each gospel has its own unique emphasis. Uh, this is the type of stuff you'll pick up in Bible college. And they'll talk about this for three hours. Really, right? You know. <laughs> in Matthew, we see Jesus as king. Son of David, Messiah, King. I'm not going to look at all the verses that deal with that. You can do that on your own. I've already done it. In Mark, Jesus is a servant of Yahweh. He's a redeemer. In Luke, he's the Son of Man. Son of Man. And where do we read the Son of Man in the Old Testament? Daniel. And the scholastic word that scholars have used, the Danielic Son of Man. And very powerful, if you're going to talk to Jews about the Son of Man, because what does the Son of Man look like in the clouds? Come and how? Come on, give me a description. Coming on the clouds? Power and glory. Power and glory, right? So, go ahead. King of Kings written on the thigh? Okay. Think that's a tattoo? Yes. Yes. Amen to that. <laughs> no, the whole point is, that is a very special figure. We can say that. It's not an angel because it's called Son of Man. And it's not just a politician. It's not an average Joe down the street. So who is it? So when you hear 
the Son of Man applied to Jesus. You have to connect that to Daniel. Way more powerful than Son of God in a first century Jewish context. Because they were all considered Son of God. Lowercase g. Here in the West, like Son of God. Wow. But that's also a little misleading because it's not like God the Father had a son in the sense that I have a son. <laughs> and now you have to go back and rethink your Trinitarianism, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You with me? What did the, the Jewish say then, or, or the new Christian Judeo something, mm. they, they, they can't pronounce the son of the name of... It's too holy. It's too holy. A, we've lost the, the, the full translation. It has to do with vowels and everything mm -hmm. else. And you talk to our theologians, they'll just go, look, Jehovah, right? You can write, write out Jehovah, and you can arrive at Yahweh, piece of cake. But you also got to remember, there's a little more reverence, I should say, within the Jewish context, right, in their culture. You know, why do you think they wear a yarmulke? Why? Because God is above, and you need to be humble and sort of cover your head a little bit. A lot of respect there. When they're praying at the Western Wall, they're not headbanging to easy to easy. Every time they do this, they're saying or thinking, God. It'll be like, for God so love the world, for so love the world, for so love the world. That gave his only son, that for God so love. The you don't say it. It's so holy. But yet you look at all the names of God throughout the Old Testament, right? Think you can say, say at least a few of them. So when you go to the Western Wall, you don't go, thank Yahweh, I'm here in Jerusalem. You'd probably be stoned <laughs> against the Western Wall. It's so holy, so yeah, it shows some respect. Um, but is that is that religion when you've taken it so far that you want to you want to pay res you want to show respect, but you do it in a religious way that actually God never intended? Yeah, that that would that would be how we think of it. His name always on our lips. Well, they would say God intended that. You know, and then you're going to go back and forth on that, and now you get into tradition. You know, you know. I don't mind religious tradition. I'd rather have some tradition than have none, you know, and just, you know, flip-flops, Christianity rolling around, you know what I mean? That's just, uh, I don't know, you know. But if that reverence goes against what God has told you to do with his name. Absolutely. That's, that's yeah. Then it's, then, it's, then it's warped or backwards. Yeah, I agree. So in Luke, he is the son of man, referring to Daniel, the son of man, uh, fully human, compassionate, the ideal man. Uh, in John, Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God incarnate, the Messiah, Christ, literal Son of God. Now, what about New Testament reliability? If we had no Gospels, I love this. If we had no Gospel, new manuscripts, right? New Testament manuscripts, like what we call manuscript evidence, Beatty, Beatty Papyri, Chester Beatty, uh, if we didn't have John Ryland's fragments and all these things, um, as a whole, just based on the writings of the church fathers alone, looking at their quotations of the Bible, the New Testament has some 36,000 verses in it. 36,000 plus verses in the New Testament. If we didn't have any New Testament documents at all, just reading Irenaeus, Athanasius, the old school church fathers, right? Even Augustine and the rest of them, right? If we just took their quoting of Bible verse, they must have quoted from something, right? But let's say we didn't have that source or those sources. We could reconstruct the entirety of the New Testament, except for 11 verses in 3 John. And, of course, the question is, when's the last time you quoted 3 John? They saw no need to quote that. So that's why it's not there. Maybe there's some church father and they left it out, but we don't have it. But that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Especially now when we have, you know, 5,700 plus Greek manuscripts, including Coptic, Syriac, uh, Ethiopic, and all of these, and you add, you know, uh, all of those together, you're at plus 25,000, right? And what's the second best attested document of ancient history? Homer's Iliad, 643 copies. 
When you get down to Plato and Aristotle on those guys, you got like, you know, less than 10. With a huge time span from the date of which the author lived and wrote it and to the earliest copy that dates to where we are. All right? Here we're dealing with 20, 30, 40 years. That's late. So, we can safely say, middle paragraph, that by the mid-50s, only some 20 years after Jesus' ascension, portions of the New Testament were in development, in use, and so forth. And the New Testament we have today, according to A.T. Robinson, that's a big name in scholarly circles, A.T. Robinson says that the New Testament has been transmitted by an accuracy of 99.9%. That's profound. Or like Geisler would say, that's better than ivory soap. All right, that's a joke. We have to edit that out of a resurrection movie today. I'm like, we can't have him say that. Or like when the Jesus seminar is voting, you know, with beats and everything, he goes, no, 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 they lost their marbles. <laughs> we have to go back and edit. He's actually quite funny. All right, given that we can deduce all of the above concerning the entirety of the New Testament for our purposes here, that tells us we can rely on accurate transmission of the Gospels, right? And survey of the Gospels. Gospels of the New Testament. Again, New Testament was completed by the year AD 100. According to F.F. F. Bruce, quote, the majority of the writings being in existence um, 20 to 40 years before this. Remarkably, there are some 5,700 New Testament documents and fragments. I already mentioned this Coptic Syriac totaling 25,000 versus Homer 643. New Testament by far the most historically reliable manuscript. Thousands of copies. That's pretty impressive. That goes hand in hand with them dating early. It goes hand in hand with Christ being viewed as God, son of man, very, very early and not doctored up by the church later on. All right, what about the so-called lost gospels? Have you heard about the lost gospels? Every so often, right? Probably hear about a few right around Easter, right? Right around the corner. Did you hear about this gospel? Been around for centuries. There's nothing lost. There's nothing lost. We've had them for centuries. It's just some scholar decided to tweak something. Been around for centuries, yet there's always a writer ready to post this as if it was new material. A few facts. New Testament gospels versus Gnostic uh, writings. You know, if you remind me, I will upload um, a PowerPoint, if I can find it, on the Gospel of Judas. I was bored in, uh, in Peru. <laughs> And uh, I brought it with me. And uh, uh, John, who has the Bible college up in Calamarca, says, hey, uh, it's funny, as soon as I got there, he got sick. So I, I didn't just teach one class, and I'm teaching three. Wow. You know, apologetics and John and everything else. I, says, I didn't say this, but I felt like saying it. The Lord struck you sick because he knew I was coming, so I could teach you stuff. I don't have any heresy here. I'm just joking. <laughs> Cross my mind, I'm like, really? Why did that happen? Is that a PowerPoint? Yeah, of Judas. What I did is I slapped together pretty quick proper. I was just reading it and, you know, going with what I have in my mind. And we did like a, an hour and a half on refuting the gospel of Judas. And it was fun. Uh, and you kind of see the differences there because you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's like Judas really doesn't have the ring of truth to it. It wasn't written by Judas uh, and so forth. Jesus is very different from the Gnostic writers and gospels. Um, Jesus frequently quoted the Hebrew Bible, something we lack in much of the Gnostic writings. Uh, Jesus was much like a rabbinical theologian, very well versed. By the way, there's a book you should get. It's called Jesus, the Jewish Theologian. Very good book. Um, very well versed in Pharisaic and Sadducean theology. Now, those big words there, Pharisaic, that's Pharisees, Pharisaic point of view. Pharisaically, this was argued, and Sadducean. Sadducean theology, not to mention Essene writings of Qumran. Um, so Nicodemus was a, uh, Nicodemus, was he a Pharisee? Was he what? Pharisee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And to my knowledge, we also lack commentaries from the early Christian writers for the first 300 years or so on these so-called lost gospels. You think you'd have a commentary? You think one of the church fathers that was quoting all of these verses in the New Testament that we reconstructed the New Testament, or that we could, 
short of 11 verses in 3 John, you think that we would have them saying, by the way, this and that, you know, Judas, Gosman Mary Madeline says this, that, this, that, this, stuff. I'm not talking about the Apocrypha. I'm talking about these Gospels. You know why they didn't quote from them? They weren't around. <laughs> they came later. So, for at least two reasons. One, they were not considered to be the Word of God. And two, many of these extra canonical Gospels, remember the canon is the accepted, received text of the Bible that we have, extra canonical Gospels came around later. This is why they don't belong in the category of Scripture. Um, so the real Jesus is found in the, real, uh, in the writings of his followers and eyewitnesses and not in documents arising out of Gnostic origin or writings, as alleged, missing Gospels. There's a good book by, uh, I think his last name is Brock, B-R-O-C-K, Missing Gospels. I think it teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary. Missing Gospels by Brock. Uh, if you just type in Missing Gospels, DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary, it should pull up that name if I'm correct on that. Very good book. Uh, light, where are we? Um, all right, let's move on. Now, uh, why the books of the Bible, particularly the Gospels? Why are they arranged like they are? Why couldn't it be, you know, John, Mark, Luke, Matthew at the end? Why? Matthew is the first book you open to in the New Testament. Yes and no. It depends who you talk to. I believe Mark was, was the earliest. Um, yeah, Matthew is the first one, right? This gospel written by disciple of Jesus, former tax collector, was, tax collector, was placed at the, at the head of the gospels very early because church fathers who compiled the New Testament, the church fathers who compiled the New Testament believe it was written first. Well, they could be wrong. Bless you. It could have been Mark. Okay. I'm after the content when we're talking about inerrancy and inspiration. I'm not after necessarily the order. Okay? Just being straight with you. So if Mark was written first, it's not like the Holy Spirit messed up. Mark should have, should have been Mark and then Matthew. Who really cares? Okay. And if Acts was placed before Luke, we could figure out that was a mistake. It would be better as a sequel. Okay. This gospel written by a disciple of Jesus, former tax collector, etc., etc. Last paragraph, the gospel of Matthew that we possess was composed in Greek, but some scholars have argued that he first wrote the gospel or portions of it in Hebrew or perhaps Aramaic. And what's Aramaic? Mm. Lewis, what's Aramaic? One good one-liner. What's Aramaic? What is Aramaic? It's a Semitic language. Semitic language. Is, okay, we're getting closer to it. Most Jews. <coughs> no, I want to say when Jesus, for example, Jesus, Aramaic. Remember, Jesus is Elo, Elo, that's the box, honey. All right? That would be Aramaic. We believe he spoke Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. So, different dialect spoken by. Uh, many Jews. He was, he was trilingual. Actually, he was more because he was God. He spoke Swedish too. He just ah. didn't. He just didn't share it. Well, if he's God, he would, right? <laughs> no, the, in, the, in the movie, the Passion, there was all Aramaic. Right. Uh, that was a uh, made-up. But it was wrong, though. They said it was going to be Aramaic. It has highlights of it, but Mel Gibson and I are the wrong dude. That was he really, that yeah. Well, they, don't, they don't know enough Aramaic of, of real Aramaic in order to put all that together. So I had to make I some of it up. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, right. Um, So the Gospel of Matthew that we possess today, composed in Greek, some have argued maybe um, portions of it, Hebrew, Aramaic, but it's not been demonstrated to the satisfaction of most scholars. Right? Most. Most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the vast majority. That's right. the, an appeal to authority to win the argument. So is the New Testament arranged in order of importance? Is it important? No. Each of the Gospels tells us about the life of Jesus, 
but each emphasize a different and necessary aspect about who the Messiah is. We talked about that earlier, right? Servant, son of God, etc. For Mark, again, he wrote Jesus was a servant. Luke, he was a savior. For John, it's God. For Matthew, we learn about Jesus as king. The kingdom has come. It's the theme, right? Why then is Matthew the first book? We're fine. Well, we got it again. Gospels are arranged by date and according to early church tradition. It was written uh, by the church. Well, the church believes it was written in the, in the 50s. Uh, 50 AD, that is. Many modern scholars hold uh, a view of Markan priority. Markan, meaning Mark. Markan priority, that is Mark, an associate of the disciple Peter, who uh, first wrote and subsequently both Matthew and Luke borrowed por portions of their account from Mark. And of course, Mark is, well, I like because Mark's the shortest. Um, you know, oldest gold, shorter. Uh, and also, not just that, when you line up, uh, this is, it's been forever since I had a class on textual criticism. Yeah. Um, my professor, hermeneutics, he got his PhD from Harvard, mm -hmm. but he's a solid guy, teaches up at Faith Seminary. Um, remember John Stewart back in the day, KKLA, the attorney? Yeah. He was my first professor of hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. Long, long ago. And when you're lining up, remember we talked about this, the Byzantine text, the Alexandrian text, and the Western text, which the Bible is based upon majority, majority of, of, of the New Testament fragments and copies of letters, right? King James was just based on the Byzantine, the NIV, looked at the Byzantine, looked at the Western text, which wasn't around when King George was you know, commissioned the King James Version to put together, and they didn't have the entirety of the Alexandrian text. So nowadays, what would you do if you were a scholar, if you were into textual criticism? You would say, wow, let's look at the Alexandrian text and the West, Western text. Let's spread it out in a football field and just line it all up and see with the Byzantine, how it squares with the Western Alexandrian text, all right? If you have longer verses in the Byzantine text, scholars are going to shorten them up and go with the cleanest, shortest version. Especially if it says, uh, I'm gonna just going to make up right now, the gospel according to Craig. Uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. It starts at verse 1. Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts, the King of kings. The I am. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The Savior of the universe. The one who will redeem even the stars. Because the universe needs to be redeemed. It groans for redemption. That Lord was born in Jerusalem. Now I am an apostle. You just see how... You know, was that a Greco-Roman genre <laughs> that crept in? Yeah, I think so, because I don't think it's gospel genre. Way too much stuff added. So if you have like, you know, three or four phrases like that at the beginning, let's just hypothetically say in Matthew, but it's not in the others. Well, we're going to go with the cleaner version. That would be one argument. So sometimes Christian copyists, they did get carried away. They would duplicate words. You see the same in Dead Sea Scrolls. I am that I am, for example. I am, am that I am. What, what happened there? Well, the guy's probably falling asleep. You know, it's the scribe is up there telling him what to write. And New Testament, New Testament copyists, right, were not as careful as the Old Testament scribes. I mean, they would, you know, they, they would be on the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. I have one slip of the pen, tear up the scroll, burn it, or give it to some school. We got a hold of it, you know, your little Gentiles copying that, you know, under, you know, with one lantern. It's like uh, just a duplication of words. We were not as traditional and careful religiously in that sense. Again, once you got to the name God, if you had to translate a chapter that had the name God in it 400 times, you're taking a lot of bats in the mikvah. Every time you got to go get the clothes off. Walk down. And God forbid, if you're walking up, you already took a mikvah, and I'm walking down, your elbow rubs against mine, you got to do it again. That's how they viewed the holy name of Yahweh. All right, so, hmm, where are we? Uh, in addition, the early church unanimously held the view of Matthew, one of Christ's 12 disciples, was the person who penned this account of the life of Christ, a view that remains widely accepted today, however... There was disagreement about the original language of this of, of his gospel account. Some have argued again, Hebrew, Aramaic, etc., uh, but they don't all agree. 
All right. What here have we not said in this? Uh, uh, this is good. Some of this is repetitious, I think. So, why did Matthew write his gospel as a Jew? Matthew, before becoming a disciple of Christ, was a tax collector. So he had access to a lot of records. A lot of records. Because, of course, he's viewed as a traitor, so he has access to Roman books, right? And Jewish genealogies. Hence, the genealogy is fairly reliable, I would say. If I'm a skeptic looking in, go, well, you know what? He had access to sources. Not really going to question it. Um, and well, while we're on the topic... Luke has a different genealogy than Matthew. What is the answer there? Gracie, Matthew and Luke, the genealogy, you guys can't get the story straight. It's a contradiction. What do you say to that? What do you say, Steve? That's cheating. <laughs> Who's Matthew writing about? I, I do that one. Joseph. Who's Luke writing about? Mary, Joseph. So you could just go, well, have you ever read Matthew and Luke? No, I just heard that at Golden West College. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, the guy was a sociologist. He wasn't a textual critic. Trick critic. You know, I've used that argument when I was getting my AA. I didn't think I should have handled it. I'm going to go, excuse me, where did you get that information from? Because I could care less if I got to see in those classes. <laughs> just get through it. Um, I got a C in logic. All my tests were A. You see? see? I could what have gone to the dean. I could have gone to the dean and complained, all this other stuff, because the professor hated me. And you know what? I didn't. It was called Understanding Arguments, the book. And I'm, I'm a Swedish, right? And I'm struggling with this, you know, so the first, first two years. I've done a, no, one year in school of ministry, and now I'm jumping into real college because I had a feeling I would want a lot more, so I have to do both, you know. Um, I rewrote the book. I had to like rewrite the book to really get it because I, I just saw the importance of logic, you know. And then I got it down to each chapter on one page. Then I got down that one page to a three by five card, you know, like that. That's how you read it if you really wanted to stick. Um, but um, I forgot what the point was. The teacher did not like you and got, gave me a C. Gave me a C. Yeah. Well, what was the point about that? Genealogy. It was Textual something. Criticism. Textual criticism. There we go. Yeah. Um, so I'd hear arguments like, you know, anybody with, you know, with common sense knows that this and that has been changed, or they throw some stuff around, just raise my hand up, and go, so where'd you get that information? And normally they'll just appeal to the authority or just go, it's common sense. Mm -hmm. Right? As is. And the word textual criticism, if you have like a psychologist or sociologist, they'd never even heard, heard those words. So you go, so have you studied textual, you say it real fast, textual criticism? You send them up because they're going to go, what? You just go, that's what I thought. <laughs> and then the class just turns around. What's this guy doing? It becomes very interesting. So every time you go like this, everybody's turning around. What's coming this time? It was funny because a lot of students would say, how do you know this stuff? I go, I read better books than this junk. I'm just here to get, the, get through it. But boy, it was hard for me. It really was. All right. Uh, he demonstrates that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. He came to establish his kingdom. Again, the kingdom theme. Kingdom is here. Um, though presently in a mystery form, Matthew 13. But, but also that the Messiah had opened up salvation of God right, to the Gentiles. You have that in Acts 15. And who went to the Gentiles with the gospel first? Paul. Paul. Right? Saul, <laughs> in view of the strong Jewish nature of the book, very strong Jewish, like if you know a Jew, right, just have him read Matthew. They'll like it. Forgot which rab uh, rabbi, which, uh, I'm not even going to go there. What's the name of that church? By the Jaffa Gate, we stayed here. Here's the Jaffa Gate. You guys would go over there and have have, have coffee in the morning. Yeah. What was the name of it? Yeah, Christ Church. Christ Church. No. Christ Church. Fawn? Fern? What was your name? Yeah, Fawn. Yeah, Fawn would go there sometimes. Fawn. Yeah, I think it was called yeah Christ Church of Jerusalem. Here it comes. Here it comes. Alexander. Alexander was a Jew in, uh, I think, Germany. Um, Jew in Germany. Jewish home. La, la, la. Started hanging around this, this, this Christian guy. They're at school together. 
And uh, he's like, have you read the Gospels? Oh, no, I can't. But we're not allowed to read that. Oh. We're not allowed to read that. Huh. Anyway, he slipped him uh, a copy of the New Testament. I think that was in German. Yeah, it wasn't happening in England. This is old information. Old. It's like three years old. I can't even remember. Um, and uh, Alexander read this. And he says, I couldn't believe the Jewishness of Matthew. It was like, of course, this is Jewish literature. This is good. You know, started looking into it. And his father, of course, wasn't pleased or any of that. Anyway, he became one of the first bishops to Jerusalem. Christ Church was founded in him. And when you get there, you look at that building. If you know his story, you're just like, wow, from one Protestant handing him the New Testament. So um, that's not in the notes. That one's for free. So Bishop Alexander was cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, as Matthew intended, um, wrote to a group of Jewish believers in Jewish, probably in Antioch uh, of Syria, to answer an obvious question to, uh, to these Jewish converts, right? What happened to the promises to Israel to be fulfilled by Messiah regarding his Davidic kingdom? Remember the Jewish mindset. This is important when you're looking at how the disciples are acting. If you know nothing about first century Jerusalem and you're reading the Gospels, you can get a little frustrated with Peter. Like, what are you doing? Right? Why did I'm not getting it? You know, over here says, we got to go to Jerusalem. i got to go die. It's like, all right, uh, should we have lunch now? Right? It went in one ear and out the other. Like, you know, really, really, uh, just a tunnel vision. They believed, like the Pharisees, <clears throat> that Messiah would overthrow Rome, and set up, right, shop in Jerusalem, and that's the way it's going to go down. So they had been taught this from day one, and here's Jesus, hey, uh, all this stuff, it's great, deliver Sermon on the Mount, which is just profound, even Dr. Phil has to use it, right, to cure patients, um, and then all of a sudden, we got to go to Jerusalem, because the Son of Man must be delivered and crucified and die. It's like, what? two comings. In any event, um, it demonstrates Jesus was in fact the Son of God, came to establish uh, his kingdom, uh, though presently in the mystery form, Matthew 13. And um, in view of the strong Jewish nature of the book of Matthew, uh, in connection to Abraham and David, mission to the Jews and emphasis of the, on the kingdom, it has a strong emphasis on Gentiles with the coming of the Magi. Remember? Those guys, the Magi's, um, they were not Jewish. The teaching about the church, Matthew 16 and 18, and the command to preach the good news to the other nations, the Gentile nations, right? And what passage is that? The Great Commission. It's like if you took a Matthew class just on Matthew alone, you have to read like two commentaries. That is like one of the Bible memory verses you have to remember for that week. Go ye therefore into all nations. Make disciples, teaching them to observe all things. That's a lot of things, by the way. That's more than you have in the Gospels. All things that I command, and don't skip a beat, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, right there. And uh, that's, of course, missionaries' favorite verse, right? Look, you gotta go. But you can't forget about your own block, right? We want to be a good example to your own block. And uh, unlike, you know, Corey, when he leaves, being all frustrated, hitting cars, leaving the track. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, no, I, that was cool. I know I had to. never thought about before about um, how did the Magi know? Uh, look for a star. Well, I was watching the Discovery Channel, and uh, no, I'm just joking. Uh, sort of, I was reading an article, and they brought up how it's probably from Daniel. How he was head of the Magi over in Babylon. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I like that point better than what you read, you know, soothsayers and astrologers. And I mean, he was he's head onto over there. Yeah. Probably the top secrets and prophecies. The scorpion. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Smell what the rock is cooking. <laughs> All right. What else? Matthew has some unique accounts, such as the genealogy from Abraham and David, the birth and early persecution uh, 
uh, visit of the Magi, the Sermon on the Mount, and the fullest statement of the Great Commission. The fullest statement of the Great Commission. Like, oh, you're there for all nations versus just kind of like alluding to it. And we'll do some of the comparisons later, like where Matthew and Mark might be in agreement. I mean, quoting the same stuff, but it's not said identically and so forth. Important. I'm going to end on this. We're going to move straight into hermeneutics because we're almost halfway into the class. And uh, Karen, you're not allowed to leave. Okay. okay All right. <laughs> now, while his gospel reaches out to Gentiles and delivers a message to the church and later begins to explain its origins, Matthew's primary audience is the Jewish community. And you could also say, hey, lighten up. <laughs> All nations. Remember Abraham? Remember good old Abraham? They're like, yeah, he's the father of many nations. You know? And like, uh, oftentimes wonder, did, did they ever sit around and go, boy, do you remember our, our father Abraham was a Gentile? Ooh. <laughs> I mean, cut, cut us some slack, right? <laughs> I saw Exodus uh, Saturday, the movie Exodus. Boy, they added a lot of stuff to that. But that was, a, yeah. I was like, really? Right, I'm glad my son wasn't watching it. It was just me and my wife, but that, that's a great... Uh, is that the one where they showed the play? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, it, was, it was it was cool. Well, I like like gladiator movies, yeah. you know, Born Identity and those Rocky things. Boys. Yeah. Like the reason yeah. that River Nile turned red was because gigantic alligators bit people. Yeah, 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 yeah I did. It was pretty awesome. But, you know, it's like Exodus is 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 one heck of a story. Right? I mean, it's like, wow. I was watching it, and I just had to, like, test my wife. I go, do you really believe this stuff? <laughs> I thought you did. This is one of those, like, check. She goes, yeah. I go, good. Good. But, you know, they add a lot of stuff here. She's like, yeah, why do they always do that? Because if they just stuck to the Exodus account, it would be a five-minute movie. <laughs> yeah. So they read between the lines, and, you know, you got to spiff it up a little bit. No, not gospel genre. Remember, we got the Greco-Roman genre. I'm joking. Making a comparison to the other stuff we talked about. So I get it. The same thing with Noah. I mean, that one was worse. He's about to kill his own daughter and grandbaby. And someone snuck onto the ark, but they didn't Yeah, I know. That's just all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> There we go, catering to Hollywood. Take my money and give me heresy. So mean. He was a very mean Noah. He was a he psychopath. Was like people. Don't get on my boat yeah, no, way. they made him out to be a psychopath. Yeah. And then in Exodus, in Exodus, Moses is questioning God. <laughs> to the point, like, are you really going to do this? Come on, like, making God out to be a moral monster. And God says, hey, just watch this time. That's how this happened. But oh, man. gigantic rock creatures, too. That helped build the ark. Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Really? I was looking at Exodus. Where? Yeah, I know. They made all sorts of stuff up. Well, the whole reason for freeing the Jews in Exodus in this version was because he, uh, Pharaoh was mistreating his workers. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's the real, <laughs> that's the real <laughs> problem. Right, that's, that's real. Why, that's why I'm a freedom. Right, right, yeah. Really I hear you. Okay, all right, let's end on this. Matthew opens his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus. He then includes Christ's Old Testament descendants. Again, Abraham, David, to demonstrate that Jesus was both Jewish uh, and from the kingly line. These are signs, messianic signs, signs of the Messiah. This would surely resonate with his audience. In fact, Matthew uses the phrases, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, more frequently than the others, all right? One question, when would Israel return to prominence? When? Are they today? Is that what happened in 1948? Think that's what we're talking about? Matthew answers some of those questions and then creates some more in the parables of Jesus. But, but as is certain in Matthew's gospel, the Messiah is here, he has come, the Redeemer is here, he has died, and he is the Messianic King. Other key events for you to look at, I uh, include, again, the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Supper, and, of course, the crucifixion and resurrection. We'll end on that point. And we're moving over to hermeneutics. Well, Matthew's got some of the, the hardest things to, fit out, to, to figure out what, what, what they're talking about when it happens and all that other stuff. 